We're here today at Shiloh, the place where God established His house for over 300 years, where an Israelite woman by the name of Hannah came in search of God, and where a team of archaeologists are carefully sifting through the soil of this 3,800-year-old tell. But what are they looking for? And what is it that all of us can find as we explore this historic site right here in the land of the Bible? Come along with us on this incredible journey as we make a connection between faith and fact here at Tel Shiloh. Shiloh lies at the heart of the Israelite territory and was eventually allotted to the tribe of Ephraim. Its name shares the same Hebrew word for rest and peace. And this name is very befitting of the place when one considers that its location lies at the northern end of a fertile valley and southwest of a spring and beautiful creek bed. The Bible gives us a really specific description of the exact location of Shiloh. In the period of the judges, after the Benjamites had been almost wiped out, they told them to come to Shiloh, and they say that Shiloh is on the highway between Bethel and Shechem, north of Bethel, south of Labona, east of the highway. And so we know the location to look for the city of Shiloh for its ancient ruin. While Shiloh was removed some 22 miles from the main international trade route, it was nevertheless accessible to local inhabitants and traders and also to Jewish worshipers like Elkanah and Hannah, who year after year made the short pilgrimage from Ramah to Shiloh to offer their sacrifices and celebrate their feast. Situated just west of modern Shiloh, Tel Shiloh is crowned with a small museum and observation tower built in memory of Hannah's prayer and the birth of Samuel. Scattered across the tell are the scars of several explorations and three major archaeological excavations. Archaeology is often by nature a destructive discipline that often requires removing and destroying earlier civilizations in order to understand the history of its earlier cities which lie at the lower levels. An ancient tell is sort of a layered mound. So we go from the top down, the deeper we go, the older the material becomes. So what Petrie discovered back in the 19th century was that the deeper you go, you can tell a difference in the ceramic profile. In other words, the pottery is older. So here at Shiloh, we have nine different stratum. And each stratum that we go through, we see a change in material culture. So it was already a hill to start with, but then it accumulates height over many centuries and many millennia. In examining this tell, it is obvious that there was an ancient city or town here with a 26 foot high massive stone wall and a wide earthen glacis surrounding a large four acre compound. A wall that Joshua would have seen as he entered the promised land for the first time and where generations of Israelites would have found refuge during times of war. I'm standing on top of the old wall. We call it the Canaanite wall, uh, the wall that was built in the Middle Bronze Age. It's a wide wall, uh, 5.2 to 5.4 meters thick. So the interface of the wall uh, comes down just to my right here, and it goes, extends down about two, two and a half meters on this side. And then on the outside of the wall, uh, we have about another two to two and a half meter drop of what's been preserved. So at some point on top of this stone, there was another span of the defensive structure that was mud brick that had eventually collapsed and then the mud brick would, would deteriorate over time. In addition to the Bronze Age wall, this 3,800 year old tell has yielded some impressive artifacts from both the Bronze and Iron Age periods. 
including things like the remains of Israelite houses, pottery, silos, wine presses, and numerous large collared rim jars. To the south, the tell contains ancient church buildings and artifacts from the Roman and Byzantine era. The remains of numerous burial caves, cisterns, and a large residential compound containing a rolling stone pocket door reveal that the Byzantine Shiloh area was an affluent and significant site. In 2007, a mosaic was discovered containing an inscription which reads, Our Lord Jesus Christ, have pity on Shiloh and its inhabitants. The mosaic was a part of the church building built sometime between the 4th and 5th century AD and attests to the early tradition associating this site with biblical Shiloh. During the Ottoman period, a Muslim mosque was built over its remains. The tell itself has a 100-year history of scientific exploration, and over those years, archaeologists have uncovered various cultic items from all of its archaeological periods. In 2013, a four-horned altar from the Iron Age Israelite period was discovered. The altar had been repurposed and used many years later in the construction of this Byzantine wall. To the west of the tell, only a mile away, an enormous four-horned altar was discovered, indicating that both Shiloh and its surrounding area was both used by the Amorites and Israelites as a highly important area for offering sacrifices and making covenants. A horned altar is an altar that's raised above the ground with a square top. But at each corner, it has a little piece that comes up above the top, which are called horns. And so a horn is a symbol of strength or power or efficacy. The horned altar that was found here at, at Chilo, uh, although in ruin, uh, signifies that this in fact was a Timonos, a place of, uh, that was designated as a holy precinct. To be sure, this was an important place, a place where annual pilgrimages were made and where, according to the Bible, the Israelites gathered to confer about the dividing of the Promised Land among seven of Israel's tribes and where they came plotting war against some of their own countrymen from Gilead whom they thought were building an altar for worship. So from a biblical perspective, it seems Shiloh occupied an important position in the lives of Israel. Why did the Israelites come to this part of the hill country, far away from the international north-south route that ran along the coastal highway? Why did an urban community develop here in this out-of-the-way place? Evidence exists that the Amorites had also used this site for worship long before the Israelites. But now the Israelites were using this place as their central capital and place of worship perhaps even making a statement that this place belonged to the God of the Israelites and not the God of the Amorites. After the Exodus and prior to the settlement period, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And as they did, they erected a tabernacle where God's presence could be found and where they could atone for their sins. It was also called the Tent of Meeting, and at the tent of meeting, the Israelites came to find the favor and blessings of God. The tabernacle is located in the center of the Israelite tribes where everyone could see it and could see the visible manifestations of God's presence. I don't think words can describe the excitement and wonder the average Israelite must have felt being near the tabernacle. Because God's tent of meeting was located so near to her town, a broken-hearted and distraught woman by the name of Hannah came here looking for help from God. The Bible says she was childless and was deeply distressed and wept bitterly in her soul. Anyone who has ever known the emotional yearnings of a woman wanting to have a child but is physically unable to can certainly identify with her pain. Stricken with such grief, Hannah made her way to the tabernacle in Shiloh and with many tears offered up her prayer to the Lord and made a vow that if God would give her a child that she would 
give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. The Bible indicates that she pleaded with God somewhere near the doorpost of the tabernacle. But where? Where would Hannah have prayed? In recent years, others have come here with similar requests, longing to be heard by God, longing to have children of their own, longing to be near the place where Hannah offered her prayer. Now, where did Hannah pray? Um, this is a good question. Um, if That depends on where the tabernacle was. Uh, she was probably very close to where we're standing right now. Uh, whether it was on the summit or the northern platform or right here, we're within a few yards of where Hannah connected with God. And that's kind of like a nexus, you know, something there, there was this desperate prayer and then there was this answer to prayer. And so when we're working here, it's awesome. You know, you're thinking uh, Hannah, Joshua, Elkanah, Eli, these are the type of people who were here. If material evidence does exist for the tabernacle, where should archeologists begin looking for it? Where exactly was the tabernacle located? Where was it that Hannah went to pray asking for a child? And where was it that Eli was sitting when he observed Hannah praying? Today, there are at least three major views. The first option was presented by explorer Charles Wilson, who studied the site in 1866 and noticed to the north of the tell a worked bedrock scarp platform whose dimensions closely resembled the dimensions of the tabernacle as given in the Bible. And it had an alignment that is situated in an east-west direction, which meets the requirement of Exodus 26, 22. Well, the northern platform has been popular since 1866. It was Wilson who noticed the dimensions of the quarry. It's really a, a rock quarry, and that's why it's rectangular. But he noticed that there were what we would call cup marks or indentations in the bedrock, surmising from that, that these were to support the post of the tabernacle. And I cannot disprove that. However, I have found cut marks at every site that I've ever uh, excavated. And so when you get to bedrock, I'm not sure why, but you find these everywhere. And that certainly doesn't mean that the tabernacle was all over the country. So in my mind, that's not a strong line of evidence. A second option for the location of the tabernacle is at the summit of the tell, which was partially excavated by Israel Finkelstein in the early 1980s. Though Finkelstein concluded that no evidence was discovered which would fit the biblical record, this location is still considered a viable location given historical precedent for a worship shrine to be positioned near the center of the city as they were at Megiddo and Tel Arad. The central plateau of the center of Tel Shiloh just happens to have the precise amount of square footage needed to serve as the platform for the Israelite tabernacle. Adding weight to this option is the nearby existence of numerous ancient storage facilities, Iron Age pillared courtyard buildings, and silos, all of which contained huge quantities of both small and large pottery containers and numerous cultic remains, and, according to Finkelstein, the richest ever discovered in Israel. All of these storage facilities containing so many types of vessels and built so closely to the summit, must have been a part of a larger complex, storage facilities that may very well have been connected to the platform and used by priests to store offerings and gifts brought to the tabernacle in worship, similar to what had been done many years later at the Herodian temple complex in Jerusalem with the construction of all of its ancillary and secondary buildings used to support the activities of temple worship and festivities. On the eastern side of Tel Shiloh, at a convenient distance from the city summit, archaeologists also discovered cultic vessels and animal bones which were most likely used in a sacrificial system. Many of those bones were discovered in a section of the Tel known as Area D, an apparent garbage dump used by the Amorites and possibly the Israelites. It would have been a convenient place to dispose of animal carcasses and broken libation pots if the tabernacle were located on top of the tell. A third option for the location of the tabernacle is on a plateau south of the tell. It was the place favored by pilgrims who came here during the Byzantine era and built two different church buildings at the site. 
Both church buildings contain beautiful mosaic flooring. One of the buildings was in the shape of a basilica. It had a nave and two aisles. Twelve column bases and two Corinthian capitals still remain visible today. A fourth option for the location of the tabernacle is proffered by Dr. Scott Stripling. It's my view that the tabernacle at Shiloh was probably mobile. Um, it could have been on the northern platform in one season of the year when the wind is predominantly coming from one direction. It could have been on the summit in another part of the year. It could have been on the southern approach a different time. It could have been right here where we're standing and excavating in, in another time. If I'm right, John, then all of Shiloh is sacred. It's not just can we find the spot of the tabernacle. The whole area is a timonos. It's sacred. And the verse of scripture that comes to my mind is Psalm 102, 14. Blessed are those who love your dust and cherish your stones. And so as my team works here and a hot day like this, uh, what motivates us is knowing that this is sacred soil that we're working in. If in fact the tabernacle moved around to different locations over its 300 year period right here at Tel Shiloh, it's conceivable that some type of evidence ought to have been discovered by now. Indeed, as of 2019, some wonderful things have been discovered, even some right down here below this hill. For only a few short seasons now, the Associates for Biblical Research have been carefully excavating at Shiloh searching for where the tabernacle might have been situated and looking for any clues that might elucidate the history of this storied site. Not only are they systematically exposing the Canaanite wall that enshrined the city, they are also carefully examining on a daily basis thousands of pieces of pottery to not only assist in determining what civilizations inhabited the various stratum of the tell, but also to see if some type of Hebraic inscription might remain, which could verify what the Bible says about an Israelite occupation at the site during the Bronze Age period. We would expect with the, with the priests to be there and, and, the, um, and the intelligentsia of Israel there during the, uh, the period of the judges, we'd expect to see some form of, of the written language in inscriptions or in, in writings. And of course, if there's writing on stone, if there's writing on um, pottery or other uh, hard materials, then we should be able to have some kind of expression of that. And we should be able to see um, evidence that, uh, that Israelites were there. Analyzing potsherds and other material remains to determine the age of the various stratum of the tell and to likewise ascertain something about the customs and beliefs of the peoples who lived here involves a scientific process that begins by peeling away the layers in a systematically determined square, dry sifting through each bucket of debris, and then wet sifting the remains, looking for the tiniest of objects or clues. With nearly every bucket of soil removed, we are learning more and more about the people who lived here. These artifacts are certainly crucial to understanding the history of Shiloh, but associates for biblical research are making some history of their own by using a field so, multispectral ostraca so imager. Out, using infrared lighting inside a makeshift darkroom, epigraphers so, are gaining an up-close examination of diagnostic pottery out at the actual excavation site. If this weren't enough, this collaborative team of Bible-believing archaeologists and other scientists are the first outside of Jerusalem to utilize both the dry and wet sifting technology. All of these advancements are yielding some incredible finds. In 2018, an extremely relevant discovery was made which has an important bearing on the historicity of Tel Shiloh and its relationship to the Bible. The discovery occurred when archaeologists were carefully sifting through the excavated material on the north side of the Tel. The discovery was an ornately crafted object made from clay and was in the shape and likeness of a pomegranate. The day we discovered the pomegranate, I took uh, two gufas a gufa is a, a bucket where we put the soil. Uh, so I sifted two gufas, and in the second one, uh, the pomegranate appeared. Uh, so 
I got excited. I didn't know what it was at the moment. I cleaned it up uh, with my fingers and I thought, this is something special. The pomegranate, along with numerous other archaeological discoveries made at Shiloh, are being carefully protected and stored in a West Bank Antiquities Authority storage facility. This is what we want right here. And so you can see the various objects uh, that we have, a, an ax head, a sling stone, uh, jewelry, beads, just all different types of objects. And here is what we're looking for, our palm granite, which was one of the top finds in Israel this last year. And here is the actual palm granite. And as I take it out, you can see that it has a hole at the top so that it can be suspended from a stand or perhaps hung from a garment. And we know of the weight, the composition of the soil, all the critical data that we need. So all together, it begins to add up and show us a picture of what life was like in antiquity. And interestingly, the uh, pomegranate trees growing here are at this exact stage right now. A pomegranate was one of the seven fruits of the land of Israel mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 8. It was the only fruit allowed to be symbolized in the tabernacle and was sculpted into the latticework adorning the temple, 200 of them on each of the two pillars guarding its entrance. Similar kinds of ornamentation can be seen in Capernaum, where allegedly 613 were carved into the cornices of the old Byzantine synagogue. The finding of a pomegranate here at Shiloh is extremely important because of the role that the pomegranate played at the worship of the tabernacle. Exodus 28 talks about the high priest's robe, and it says on the hem of the robe, it's supposed to be ringed all around with bells and pomegranates. In fact, it says a bell and then a pomegranate, a bell and then a pomegranate. And so the pomegranates were used to ring the bells on the bottom of the high priest's robe. Well, the, the discovery of the pomegranate last season was critical for several reasons. Number one, the Bible mentions them. And so inductively, we're beginning to see evidence accumulate of this cultic system. The Bible mentions the pomegranate as sacred. In fact, it's the only fruit that goes into the presence of God, even into the Holy of Holies. So for us, that's a symbol of sanctity of, a, of the uh, Holy of Holies. And now we found it right behind me here, next to this large east-west wall that I was talking about. The pomegranate discovered at Shiloh, however, isn't the only one of its kind. In 1979, a sculpted pomegranate made out of animal bone and larger than a human thumb surfaced on the antiquities market. While the debate over its authenticity continues, one of the biggest issues relating to its provenance has always been that it had not been found in situ by an archeologist. So to find the Shiloh pomegranate in location at an Israelite site associated with the tabernacle is incredibly important. However, in an intriguing turn of events, it turns out that the first pomegranate to be discovered at Shiloh wasn't in 2018 as had been originally thought. Uh, interestingly, the Danish also excavated a pomegranate when they excavated at Shiloh in the 1920s, but they misidentified it as a stopper. In the report, we found it, and so we sent a member of our team to Copenhagen, who then did all the core research on it there. We're publishing both of these together, and we're beginning to inductively build a case, I think, from the bone evidence, the presence of these large east-west walls, the presence of palm granites at the site, that indeed we're looking at evidence of an early Israelite cultic site, as is described in the Bible. The pomegranates, along with the many storage rooms, storage vessels, sacrificial animal bones, cultic vessels, and the dimensions of a platform perfect in size for the tabernacle, is nevertheless extremely compelling evidence that the tabernacle may have been located at the top of the tell. While indisputable archaeological evidence has yet to surface which would prove any one of these three locations, there is one bit of evidence that corroborates the biblical narrative that no one disputes, and that is that Shiloh was destroyed. Shiloh's destruction most likely occurred at the hand of the Philistines when Israel lost the Ark of the Covenant near Ebenezer, just 22 miles away. Having disregarded God's law, 
The ark had been foolishly removed from the tabernacle and taken near to where the Philistines were amassing their forces at Aphek. This territory belonged to the Israelites, and they needed it for their livelihood. But because of their disobedience, they suffered a major defeat, losing some 30,000 infantrymen. It is presumed that at the same time, the Philistines also sacked the beloved city of Shiloh. Some 450 years later, the prophet Jeremiah would warn the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah, who had themselves been on a path of apostasy, to consider what happened at Shiloh, lest their beloved temple also meet its demise. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name? Go now to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. The beloved tabernacle would never again come to rest in this historic place. A peaceful place, as its name suggests, now became a place of destruction and its name a proverb for divine judgment and the place of an apostate shrine. Today, evidence of that destruction is apparent. The destruction was so devastating that according to Israel Finkelstein, in some places, the ash layer was nearly three feet deep. Archaeological research confirms the importance of Shiloh in early Israelite history. Now, Jeremiah does refer to the desolation of Shiloh, and the evidence indicates that its destruction was particularly violent. Jeremiah was right. It was left desolate. While the Bible doesn't say who destroyed Shiloh, Psalm 78 and Jeremiah 7 clearly reveal that this place had for a time ceased to exist, and now Archaeology has affirmed it. The Bible then can most certainly be trusted and year after year, this land is revealing more and more evidence to support the Bible's claims. And it is likewise reminding us of some very valuable lessons about both the goodness and the judgment of God. This tale has many more secrets yet to be revealed, but there is at least one discovery that occurs here year after year, and it's the discovery of a strengthened faith by all those who come to visit and work here. It's hard to articulate the ways that, that it gets inside you and makes you want to be as close to God all the time as you feel like you are when you're on this ground. For my faith personally, it allows me to connect more into the Bible and it gives me a more realistic understanding it just, it makes the Bible come alive. I mean, that I can actually stand here beside these stones that are part of the wall and just envision that. And it, then it, it's not just words on a page anymore. I mean, it's, it's like a, it's, it's, it just, it lives. It lives in you and you can visualize and see that this, these are based in historical reality. It gives me a personal feeling of really connecting with them as real people and not just people in the Bible or just names on a page. Kind of reflecting back on the Bible when God is speaking to Samuel and you know seeing the walls that God's voice might have echoed off of is just truly amazing and I just think you know seeing what Samuel was seeing when God was speaking to him is just really cool. My faith has been strengthened because I get to see all of the ways that the Bible is true and correct and holds together with history and archaeology and just everything. Shiloh truly is a place rich in history, a place where we can learn about the process of archaeology and the reliability of the Bible. But one major lesson we are left with at Shiloh is about the great Bible doctrine of faith. At Shiloh, we can learn that faith is connected to facts. While faith involves complete trust, according to Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith is also founded upon evidence. Faith has a foundation. While knowledge isn't faith, 
Faith and knowledge are not mutually exclusive. Faith and knowledge should be coupled together. Faith is predicated on tangible, knowable facts. Faith in the Bible isn't a blind leap or a baseless faith, but rather it is connected to real geographic locations with tangible evidence of the many locations and people identified in its story. The Bible stories aren't myth or legend. Its heroes were real, and its stories are a part of verifiable history. Secondly, at Shiloh, we learn that genuine faith should lead us to obey God. The prophet Samuel, who grew up here as a boy, learned to listen and obey when called by God. But many of those to whom he preached as an adult rebelled and were disobedient. As a result, God allowed Shiloh to be destroyed. According to James 2, 14 through 16, faith without works is a dead faith. And you think about the faith that was demonstrated here on the part of Samuel and Hannah. Hannah, of course, could have believed in her heart that she would have a son, but she acted upon that by going to the tabernacle and praying. And there are so many other examples of, of hearing with the intent to obey. So faith and obedience go hand in hand, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Finally, let us remember that faith should lead us to be completely dependent upon God wherever we find ourselves. Our faith should cause us to go to the tent of meeting, not just in times of celebration, but also when we are broken and hurting. Hannah came to Shiloh when she was hurting because she knew God's house was there. But today, we don't have to go to Shiloh to have our prayers answered, for God can be found wherever we are and in whatever condition we find ourselves. On a hill in Athens, Greece, far away from the hill of Shiloh, the Apostle Paul said, God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, and that He isn't far from any one of us. To be sure, God can be found here at Shiloh, but He can also be found all over the world, whether we are in the midst of a marital crisis, physical pain, financial ruin, or more importantly, when we are burdened by sin, the God who revealed Himself at this place for over 300 years has fully revealed Himself in the person of Jesus Christ, the Shiloh with whom the scepter will never depart, the Shiloh that can bring everlasting peace and hope. So go now to Shiloh and remember the people who came here and the tabernacle that once stood here and the lesson about faith that can be learned here. Nearly 2,600 years ago, the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah said, go now to Shiloh. So we did. And our visit there was both faith building and it was sobering to stand in the place where God's tabernacle was located and where the Ark of the Covenant once rested really does connect you to history. And it reminds you that the events of the Bible really happened. The places are real. It was here at Shiloh that Hannah came to pray when she poured out her heart to God asking for a son. And it was at Shiloh that the great prophet Samuel was trained. So to walk on the same hallowed ground where our forefathers of faith once walked really does help make the Bible come alive. But on this trip, we didn't just study and we didn't just photograph the site. At Shiloh, we were privileged to help excavate a part of history and to work in an area that hasn't been touched by human hands for nearly 3,000 years. To assist in uncovering a wall from the Bronze Age period, to peer into ancient tombs and to hold ancient pottery in your hands that was last touched by perhaps someone like Samuel or maybe even Hannah, that's all inspiring At an archaeology dig, you literally get to see and touch the history revealed in the Bible. And in the process, you come to better understand the gravity of Scripture. Of course, when Jeremiah said, go to Shiloh, he wasn't speaking to me personally, but rather to the nation of Judah who was on the verge of apostasy. And they needed to be reminded that if God allowed 
the place where his tabernacle once stood to be destroyed, that he would also allow Jerusalem to be destroyed. It's a sober reminder to you and me that God values our faithfulness, that the land he chose, the land that his eyes are on, is not what he loves, it's his people, his church that he loves.